I am delighted to welcome back our next guests, the lawyers from the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry. I'm joined today, actually, I don't know, Charlotte, if you're new to the committee, but it's the first time you've been with us on Crowdsource the Truth. Charlotte Dennett is with us, and Mick Harrison. How are you today, Charlotte? How are you, Charlotte? I'm fine. Excellent. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly new, relatively new. Okay. Unlike, unlike Mick, who's been at it for years. Yeah, I Mick to say is, I'm ancient, I think. <laughs> well, you've been with us, certainly. I was thinking about this earlier, Mick. You know, we really have known each other for several years now, and you guys have been at it for a long, long time. I've just met Charlotte, and she's written a book that I'm very interested to read. It's called Follow the Pipelines, Uncovering the Mystery of a Lost Spy and the Deadly Politics of the Great Game of oil. Now, this is a book about your father. I think we're going to have to have you back to talk about this in the future. But Mick, Charlotte, which of you would like to tell us exactly what it is that brings you back today to discuss the latest developments with the committee? I know, Mick, you not long ago did a very informative interview with George Galloway, and you were telling us about you know, it's it's funny because it's been several years that the Lawyers Committee has been trying to get truth with regard to 9-11, but it seems like every time you guys go to the well, they have some other reason why justice can't be served. What can you tell us about this? Yeah, you noticed that, Jason. So um, it's been a pattern. Uh, we've been trying for seven years now to get a meaningful judicial audience for the evidence that we have developed and articulated, particularly the evidence of use of explosives at the Trade Center on 9-11, what we call the demolition evidence. And we started with a petition to the U.S. attorney and a federal grand jury in New York in 2018. Um, the U.S. attorney, as best we can determine, refused to deliver it to the grand jury, contrary to law and his duty under a federal statute. That led to a federal lawsuit in the district court in New York, and the court there decided one of those decisions you're referring to, that we didn't have standing. Not only we, the lawyers committee, but architects and engineers didn't have standing. Uh, some of the first responders didn't have standing. Some of the family members didn't have standing, which left, a, left us to wonder who does have standing to, to enforce the statute. And um, as best we could determine, uh, no one would. So we appealed to the Second Circuit, the highest, second highest court in the country, uh, U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. They decided not long ago to affirm the district court decision that we did not have standing. And in the way they articulated their decision, it caused us at least three constitutional concerns which brought us to where we are today, which is why we appreciate the chance to talk with you again, Jason. And that is tomorrow, I do mean tomorrow, tomorrow, the U.S. Supreme Court will have a conference to consider a number of cases, one of which is ours. And the U.S. Supreme Court is on the verge of deciding whether to take our case or to not take our case. Uh, we did a petition to the U.S. Supreme Court, a petition for certiorari, um, to review the Second Circuit decision, requesting that it be reversed. And that decision could be made tomorrow or soon thereafter. And that's sort of the news that is news uh, today. Um, but there are three sort of fundamental constitutional concerns about the Second Circuit decision we want the Supreme Court to take up. When you're ready for that, I'm happy to articulate those. Well, yeah, I'm and, definitely and Jason, interested. Jason, if I could just yeah. jump in just for a second. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I um, had a case that, that uh, went before the Second Circuit, and um, it was trying to get all the records of my father, who was a CIA. Um, well, he wasn't quite CIA, OSS, CIG, died in a mysterious plane crash. I was trying to get the records through FOIA. Uh, and then they didn't grant it. And so I went to the Supreme Court and uh, my case was just dismissed among thousands. You know, wow. thousands, I, I can't tell you how many tiny percentage gets accepted. So when Mick told me that he was informed that on January 6th, 
uh, they were going to consider our case, I thought, whoa, I think that's different. I think they're really seriously considering. If they do, whoa, we're going to need a lot of support. And if they don't, well, we've got plan Bs. I want to hear about plan Plan B. B. I want to hear about plan B, but it's I'm immediately caught by the fact that on January 6th, they're going to be discussing your case about 9-11. If we could get some kind of JFK inquiry in there, the universe might implode. Yeah. <laughs> well, don't hold your breath on that, but uh, the only reason they might not be considering JFK is that nobody's put it in front of them recently. It is still a legitimate question, um, unfortunately. Uh, which is another one of those major wrongs that has never been righted or fully investigated even. But back to the wrong of the moment, which is the Second Circuit's decision to not allow our case to be decided on the merits. And our case is very simple. You know, you just wouldn't think the courts would refuse to hear it on the merits. The the case is simply, do we have a right, all of our co-plaintiffs, to have our petition articulating all this demolition evidence, a lot of eyewitness testimony, uh, scientific evidence, lab results, all of that. Do we have a right to have it delivered, just delivered to a grand jury? We're not even asking for the grand jury to agree with us. We're not asking for the court to agree with us on what that evidence means. We just want it delivered so the grand jury can make up its own mind in its own independent role about what that evidence means. And you would think That would be a no-brainer because there is a federal statute that puts a mandatory duty on the U.S. attorney when a citizen reports a crime, a federal crime, the U.S. attorney has an obligation to deliver it to the grand jury, that report of the citizens. So you might be surprised to know that the district court and the court of appeals did not say the U.S. attorney did not have that duty. They did not say that. That duty exists in plain language in a federal statute. What they said was we didn't have a right to enforce it because none of us are affected in a way that the law recognizes as legal standing under Article Three of the Constitution, which to me is a uh, an extreme uh, misconstruction of Article Three and the minimum constitutional standing requirements to be heard in a court. The one of the more offensive things to me, and Charlotte may want to weigh in on this, is that. We had a First Amendment claim in this complaint. It wasn't just a complaint to enforce the federal statute and the duty on the U.S. attorney under the Administrative Procedures Act. That was one of our counts. But we also had a First Amendment count. And it basically said every citizen has a right to petition every entity of the federal government. The grand jury is one of those entities of the federal government. And when the U.S. attorney blocked delivery of our petition, to the grand jury, the U.S. attorney was obstructing our First Amendment rights to have that petition delivered because it was simply a petition to a government entity under the First Amendment. There's been case law since virtually forever that when a constitutional right is violated, that the citizen whose right was violated has a right to go to a court and complain and seek a remedy for the violation of their constitutional right. The Supreme Court and the Courts of Appeals have been saying that for decades, that, you know, it's the violation of your constitutional right. It's that constitutional harm that gives you legal standing to seek a remedy for for a constitutional violation. You'd think that might be a no-brainer. I think it is a no-brainer. But the Second Circuit, in our case, said, well, and it was a bit of an ambiguously worded decision. It said one of two things or possibly both. One was, no citizen has standing to complain of a violation of a constitutional right without some other kind of showing of additional harm. What? That isn't, yeah, that isn't the law. Okay. That isn't the federal (laughs) law. And, and maybe the judge, judges didn't mean to say that. Uh, The judge, the the judge that authored the opinion. But let me pause you a second, because this is very serious. They're basically telling you that the first amendment is nothing. And we have a lot of other things that are telling us that. We've got the Disinformation Governance Board. We've got the FBI all up and down Twitter saying, delete this person. That's disinformation. 
no due process deciding what you said is wrong and you've slandered somebody or this is incitement to something. They're basically, this, what you're telling us right now, you're being very diplomatic in the presentation. Maybe they didn't mean to say it, this and that. My interpretation is we are living in de facto post-constitutional America where the Constitution is essentially a nuisance to the people like those in charge of deciding these types of things. Well, that is a concern. And um, let me be clear, while maybe still trying to be diplomatic, the, um, the, the national scenario you're describing, which is real, about the disregard for constitutional rights is a concern to a lot of people on a lot of different issues. It isn't just 9-11. And the problem with our case is, unless the Supreme Court takes this up and corrects it, this decision could be misused, misinterpreted, or it could be used, if correctly interpreted, to mean that citizens will basically not have an avenue to enforce constitutional rights because they won't be able to meet this new threshold, which has never existed before, for legal standing to enforce a constitutional right. And, it, and that decision, if it stands, won't just be applied in 9-11 context. It'll be applied in any constitutional right case that comes up. And that's it the becomes scary case part. law precedent. This is the danger, yeah. that they've got this precedent now that they can refer to all the time. Now, I may have misunderstood something that you said to George Galloway, but you went into a bit of detail about how the power of the grand jury itself is being threatened because, and this is something that Larry Clayman had told me in the past, that the grand jury is the is a tool of the people, not the government, that we own the grand jury. Can you speak about that a bit? Well, that what you just said is a correct statement. The grand jury is independent of every branch of government and is supposed to conduct its own investigations, determine for itself whether to issue an indictment or not, um, the decision we're talking about here, the Second Circuit decision we want the Supreme Court to review and correct, essentially eliminates that independence, that longstanding constitutional independence of the grand jury, because it puts in the hands of the U.S. attorney. And if you read the Second Circuit decision, it pretty much literally says it's not um, citizen's job to determine what evidence to give to the grand jury. It's the U.S. attorney's job and only the U.S. attorney's job. So if this decision stands, the U.S. attorney is going to be a gatekeeper for everything the grand juries see and don't see. And that essentially destroys the function of the grand jury as it existed before the Constitution and as it was adopted in the Constitution. Um, you, may, you may realize that the grand jury was initially created to protect citizens from political prosecutions, prosecutions that an administration might bring for example, to go after their political adversaries or someone who was criticizing them, maybe a nonprofit citizen group, for example, that was giving them a hard time on some some issue. Sounds you know, like something be they've been issues, doing. In which they've been it? doing. Yes. So, well, yeah, to, to a certain extent they have. And I mean, you know, COVID is an issue like that. There are some other issues like that where people speaking out are getting, you know, various forms of not only uh, gag, you know, gagging, but also discrimination or retaliation. So the grand jury is supposed to be a protection for all of us to prevent our government from using criminal prosecution powers to come after us when we don't agree with them. We don't agree with their politics or any other basis. Charlotte, do you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, now, I just want to put it in a larger context. Uh, I mean, we're, we're, we're dealing, obviously, at a very critical time. And one of the big themes that we are hearing over and over again is preservation of democracy. And when a citizen doesn't have a right to petition, it's government. And, and when you have uh, evidence of horrendous crimes of this magnitude and the prosecutors are going to block us, they're going to prevent people from even getting to a grand jury, which was set up even originally opposed to the monarchy. So what we're seeing at a time is a stripping away of many of our rights. And many of us are concerned about authoritarianism uh, creeping into all levels of, of, of our government. Um, 
And it, it occurred to me that the Supreme Court right now has a problem with its credibility. And yet, I think there are literally millions of Americans who are very concerned that the official story of 9-11 was never told, and they want justice, and they want accountability. And I'm talking to people on the left, on the right, independents, liberals. There are millions of people. And in fact, I think Ed Asner, the late Ed Asner, who was once a member of our board, said the, that the 9-11 truth community is the largest civilian uh, organization, if you want, grassroots movement that ever existed, clamoring for justice and more accountability. And one of the things that, that drew me to the board was thinking about all the victims, the families, the, the people uh, who, who live next to a very toxic site, uh, to ignore their, their pain and their concerns, I think, would be outrageous. So I am hoping that the Supreme Court takes a long look at, at how people are going to be looking at this case. And uh, I, I would also encourage people to speak their mind about how important it is that we have this accountability. Yeah. And, you know, 9-11 and the work that the Lawyers Committee has been doing you know, Mick mentioned that you guys have been doing this for seven years, and I think I've certainly known you for five or six. It, um, it seemed like an anomaly in the beginning that you were being rebuffed and ignored and all of these outcomes were so strange. But now, since you started, we've had January 6th, and there's people who have been sitting in jail for, uh, basically, we're coming up on two years, and they haven't, that's not a speedy trial as far as I can tell, and that's a constitutional right. And we've got this disinformation governance board just taking people off of Twitter, the FBI telling Elvis Chan to tell Yoel Roth to take Twitter, just whoever they want. It, um, it's an accelerating pace, isn't it, Mick? I mean, they're, they're destroying every constitutional right. Well, I mean, every is, is a broad term, but we, we were seeing just the good you know, movement in, in the wrong direction, significant movement in deteriorating our rights. It started, I mean, most recently, most recently being now 21 years ago with the Patriot Act, which took away some of our rights and interfered with some of our rights through illegal surveillance and so forth. The pattern is continuing across a number of issues. And let me uh, punctuate the problem, the description of the problem by noting that the grand jury has two constitutional functions. We've talked about one of them, which is to protect against political prosecutions, which is one of their functions. They have sort of a shield and a sword function. The shield function is the one we talked about, protecting against political prosecutions. They also have a sword function, which is to indict folks for crimes that the evidence indicates really were committed who deserve to be indicted. The problem with the decision we got from the Second Circuit and why we need the Supreme Court to reverse it is that it's going to interfere with both of those constitutional functions. Because if the if the U.S. attorney can control what the grand jury sees and doesn't see in terms of evidence, like they are in our case, they're preventing the grand jury from seeing the evidence in our petition of the demolition. That means the grand jury is not allowed to make up its own mind. Was there a bombing crime committed on 9-11 at the Trade Center? that caused most of the those unfortunate and tragic deaths that occurred at the Trade Center on 9-11. And so you've got uh, a huge constitutional problem that is has two aspects, both of which are significant. You can now, if this doesn't get corrected, start to see political prosecutions. And there was some sign of that in prior administrations. I remember one of those Saturday night or some night massacres where a lot of the U.S. attorneys got fired by one of the administrations because they wouldn't sign on to polit political prosecutions. And, it was, and there may have been more than one president who tried to do that. So it's not unheard Bill, of. Bill Clinton but, was the first to fire all I, I, the U.S. attorneys. Okay, well, it's not uncommon to fire them. What's uncommon 
and this you might consider this semantics, but it isn't entirely, is to fire them after they refuse to prosecute one of your political adversaries. And that happened in one of the administrations. I think it may have been a Bush administration. But, I, you know, I'm not trying to be partisan here either way. Uh, there's been politicization of the U.S. Attorney's Office across parties. This is not a, a, you know, a party problem. It's a constitutional problem with our government. And we need to prevent the Department of Justice from being politicized. The grand jury is one of our best, best protections for that in two different yeah. directions. It allows people to be prosecuted who deserve it, and it protects people from being prosecuted for political and wrongful reasons. Um, we may now, lose both of those protections. And if I may interject, Mick, I would slightly disagree that it's no longer a need of preventing the DOJ from getting politicized. We need to route the politicos that are in there and get it back to being not politicized. I, I want to ask you about something that you may not be aware of simply because it's so new and I didn't okay. know about it until just a few days ago. This is a report that was released in September of 2022 from the Office of the Inspector General of the Department of Justice. This is an audit of the roles and responsibilities of the Federal Bureau of Investigation's Office of the General Counsel in national security matters. Now, you mentioned national security letters in the Patriot Act. This is very concerned with that. One of the revelations that came out of this thing was that uh, Louis Free, who was the FBI director appointed by Bill Clinton, who I believe was the first U.S. president to fire all of the uh, U.S. attorneys at once. This is telling us about the evolution of the FBI's Office of General Counsel. And it says, the inspector general tells us that in October of 1993, as part of a major reorganization of how the FBI utilized its attorneys, then FBI Director Louis Free created the office of the general counsel and eliminated the FBI's legal counsel division. Now, the important distinction here is that the legal counsel division had been staffed primarily with special agents who were also attorneys, and the agent attorneys were rotated in and out of the division every two years. They say as part of the FBI's career development program, but I've spoken to other people who say that this practice is born out of the same practice from judge advocate, you know, in the military to prevent any individual from consolidating power in the yeah. office of legal counsel. But when Louis Free created this office, I'm not sure if you know, as far as I can tell, there really aren't too many records of who took that office prior to this individual. I believe this was the first person to ever hold the office of FBI General Counsel, Valerie Caproni. She's a U.S. District Court judge in the Southern District of New York. And um, where does it say that here? She was the FBI General Counsel. Yeah, I'm familiar with her background. Yeah. And uh, she was there for eight years. Here we go. August 2003, your favorite FBI director and mine, Robert Mueller, named Caproni as general counsel, and she played a leading role in limiting the involvement of FBI officials in, in interrogations of Guantanamo captives. The thing that it's not telling you here is that, you know, as the FBI general counsel, she was tasked with defending the FBI when charges were brought against them. So she's essentially the main lawyer for the FBI. When you go and say, hey, the FBI is uh, obstructing our First Amendment rights, and lying to us about occupying Twitter, not investigating 9-11, all these things, she's there to argue and say, no, they're not. Get out of the court. You lose. We're doing everything right. Well, now she's a judge. Someone like her now, but she used to be. Now she's a judge. and I appreciate, I appreciate that. Second Circuit is the same district she's in. So does this... I, I, if I, again, <laughs> I've had experience with the OLC, Office of Legal Counsel, um, this was uh, during the Bush years. You know, who, who was sitting in there, if I've got it right? It was uh, uh, John Yu and, and, and Bybee who had crafted the Bush administration's torture policy. And they came under, the, the Office of Legal Counsel uh, came under serious scrutiny because of that. Because that was, that was very, de the, the torture policies 
was very devastating uh, to the U.S. image in the world. So people became aware of that office and how they had actually created laws to justify the torture of detainees that had been pulled off the fields in you know, Afghanistan and Iraq, thrown into Guantanamo. And then, uh, well, anyway, we all know about those hor horrendous torture stories. So, uh, But that's, wouldn't that have been the Office of General Counsel by the time they were I doing remember, I remember it as the Office of Legal Counsel. Now, I'll have to uh, double check on that. If it was after 1993. So, so, Jason, one of the documents you put up there did say General Counsel. I think there may be some of both uh, offices involved well, they, in the types of issues you're concerned about. But if you're trying to make the point that the DOJ has been from time to time politicized, and I would say by both political parties from time to time, you're preaching to the choir, to me at least. And I want to make sure I the think, point's not missed. I'm sorry to interrupt, okay. me. The point yeah. I'm trying to make is 1993, according to the office of the inspector general, the FBI made a significant change that consolidated a lot of power into the FBI office of general counsel that enabled it to do exactly what Charlotte is talking about, yeah. to make laws, to argue on behalf. What they're always looking for, and this is another thing I'd like your opinion on, I have heard people like Valerie Caproni and other FBI general counsels and FBI directors talk about the need for a legal basis for something. And I presume that that means if we have a constitution that says the people are protected in their privacy and protected from undue search and seizure in their persons and their papers or whatever, that's the law. Then yeah. if somebody makes a new law that says, hey, if because it's 2001 and, you know, terrorism, if somebody is a national security threat, now, forget about this constitution over here, we have a new thing. It's not criminal law, it's counterterrorism, and we don't need due process, we don't need evidence for a search warrant, we're just going to write this letter that says you're a national security yeah, threat and we can investigate you. Yeah, that's bogus. That's the I basis. Mean, it's, it's, it's happened, but it's, in my view, it's but not But that's the basis, isn't it? I they can go I argue. I understand what you're saying. Uh, if well, I... Uh, in, I wrote a book called The People Versus Bush uh, after I ran for attorney general in Vermont. And uh, one of my pledges was to prosecute Bush in Vermont uh, for, the, for the war, and taking people to the uh, our troops to war in Iraq uh, on a lie. And um, one of the, in one of my chapters, I, I actually map out how the Bush administration was going to justify uh, its invasion uh, of Iraq, and it was the uh, they, they he relied on uh, you and Bobby to craft new laws to justify an illegal evasion. So, I, in any way, I think your concern is deep, and we shouldn't forget we're so um, consumed with what's going on now, and we should right. be. Uh, but let us not forget about that war in Iraq, which happened right after 9-11 and the invasion of Afghanistan. And if you look at it in a historical context, you can see uh, all the maneuvers of very powerful people uh, to make it happen. And that unfortunately required uh, distortion of the law and creating new laws to justify it. So if I may, Jason, let me give you uh, an example to punctuate the point you made. And Charlotte is making, I guess we're all making it that there's abuse in the executive branch and the Department of Justice of our constitutional rights, even though they're the branch and the office that should be enforcing the law. And they should know better than anyone else what it is. So it's more disturbing when they start to misconstrue the law and abuse it. But in our in the case we're talking about in the moment, that's now before the Supreme Court for a decision on a petition for certiorari which will be discussed at least tomorrow, among other cases, that case involves a very clear example of what we're talking about. And that is that there's the federal special grand jury statute, which says in no uncertain terms that every U.S. attorney must, shall, mandatory, deliver 
to a grand jury a citizen report of a crime given to a U.S. attorney. There's a reason why that duty is mandatory, because when Congress amended the laws to make it a crime, which a lot of folks may not realize, they made it a crime for the citizens to report something in writing directly to a grand jury, other than a request to appear. So now if I were to write a letter to the grand jury and give them evidence, I probably would be put in jail. Because Wait, when did that start? Yeah, it's been some time back. It's been 20, 30, 40 years ago now. I forget, forget the year. Wow. But it, it, communicating, citizens communicating and writing to a grand jury about substance is now a crime. Now, in the, in the old days, even before there was a constitution, citizens could communicate directly with grand juries. And that type of grand jury system was adopted in the constitution. So this statute purports to change the nature of communication channels with grand juries, whether it is valid, whether it's constitutionally valid is a legitimate question. It may not be. But my point is this. Congress put in this safeguard after they made that change to criminalize communication with grand juries to make sure citizens could still get their reports to the grand juries. They just had to go through a U.S. attorney, not as a gatekeeper, but just as a conduit. And it was a mandatory duty for the U.S. attorney to pass on the report from citizens. What happened in our case was the U.S. attorney said, we're not going to do that. And the court said, we're not going to let you, lawyers committee and others, including family members of 9-11 victims, enforce that duty, even though that duty exists. To show you how blatant of a disregard for that law this is, if you look at the U.S. attorney's manual, where they, in their own words, describe what they believe the law is, and they train up their own, you know, uh, DOJ members on through this U.S. Attorney's Manual. It says, at least as strong and maybe stronger than the statute says, that if a U.S. Attorney gets a report of a crime, a federal crime from a citizen, the U.S. Attorney shall report that information to the grand jury. So the law is clear. The DOJ has recognized the law is clear, and yet it's thumbing its nose at that law and the courts aren't letting us enforce it, putting aside the standing issue that the Supreme Court is going to take up, we hope, tomorrow. Um, you know, this is an example where the DOJ knows what the law is, and they just decided not to follow it. Uh, that in itself is disturbing. Were you surprised? I, I consider it grievously insulting. Absolutely. I really do. It's insulting to us, the people, to, now, Charlotte, to just abandon... You uh uh the statutory mandate like that shouldn't and be you, happening you've been through the ringer trying to get the information about your father's mysterious death so perhaps this wasn't a surprise but i wonder when it began were you or mick or any of the other lawyers surprised and how has that emotion evolved over the process and talk about mm -hmm. that a little bit do you well, want to, I, want, I want to defer to Mick on in terms of the history of this struggle. Sure. Uh, well, let me, he yeah. was there, not I wasn't. Well, let me start with the early part, and then Charlotte can chime in on what she has seen since she's come on, maybe even before. <clears throat> but we had differences of opinion, Jason, in the lawyers' committee when we started about what to expect from the federal courts if we were to bring the demolition issue to the courts if we were asked the law to be enforced simply as it is written to get a grand jury to look at this evidence to get a court to look at it we had differences of opinion and, and those differences of opinion weren't about what the law is they were about what do we expect the doj and the judiciary to do when they're put to the task on this issue and we were not all of the same mind on that uh, there were some who were very skeptical because of the way 9-11 cases had been, had been treated in the past, other 9-11 cases, that the judiciary would give this a fair hearing. I was one who was saying, well, let's put the facts and the law and the logic in front of the courts and put them to the test. They have an obligation to decide these cases objectively and fairly. The DOJ has an obligation to follow the law. Let's ask him to do it and see what happens. And, you know, and we found out over a period of years, piece by piece, what is happening, and it's not very encouraging. Uh, I will say this, though, before we get completely dismayed with the judicial system, that um, I am still doing a freedom of information case that's 9-11 focused against NIST and FEMA 
to get documents on the the FEMA study of the building collapses at the Trade Center on 9-11, which have, have been some of the key ones have been withheld. And I, we've been suing on that since 2015, which is now, what, seven years? Wow. Now, however, we're winning that case. And um, we did. We were granted discovery to uh, put some of the NIST and FEMA folks under oath, which we did. We were granted the right to do compulsory document production requests, which we did. And we now are in a stronger position to win that case, even though we were winning it to begin with because of the improper withholding of those documents. So uh, it's been a little bit of a mixed bag depending on which court we're in, which judge we get, and what issue is put in front of the court. But uh, one of the reasons the FOIA case is probably proceeding as routinely and successfully as it is, is there is no standing um, requirement defense for a FOIA. Yeah. In a FOIA. You know, I think, Mick, a lot of people watch Crowdsource the Truth and they see the Lawyers Committee come on and they say, oh, good, lawyers are fighting for 9 11. And they figure, well, you guys are lawyers, so you don't need to hire lawyers, so this is free, right? But obviously, you're spending <laughs> a ton of your time, and that takes away from your ability to work yeah. for clients. So it's very important for people to know that they can donate and financially support what you are doing. Now, I know you guys have a truncated URL for the website. What is the best way for people to reach you and contribute to what you're doing? Yeah, lcfor911.org lc for 911.org we we are in desperate need of those contributions uh i appreciate your mentioning it jason but i've donated a lot of my own personal money to this cause over seven years i've reached the end of that rope unfortunately mm. uh i've donated a lot of my time and i'm at the stage where i may have to you know like i say somewhat humorously get a real job um <laughs> uh, uh, you know, a full-time job working on other good causes for a nonprofit or a law firm, but still it wouldn't be 9-11. And, and I wish a bunch of my colleagues would jump into this cause and essentially take my place. We haven't seen that happen yet. We have some good folks like Charlotte on our board and Bruce liked you, who we were hoping would join us, but I feel good about that infusion of sort of new legal blood, but they, but they've come on to help us make policy but not to litigate. And it takes a lot to litigate these cases. I may talk one of them into doing a case at some point, but uh, it's really demanding, as you say, and yeah. you can't really keep doing it for free for very long. So uh, though the donations matter and they, they may matter this year more than ever, because we may be at a fork in the road in mm -hmm. terms of what we can continue doing. Uh, you know, I'm a public interest lawyer. Uh, I don't get paid often. When I get paid, I don't get paid much. And when I do get paid, I use most of the money to put back into the cause. So, uh, you know, that I've been doing, you know, as much as I can for seven years on this issue and am now very limited. I did, you may not know this, I did resign from the board of directors of the lawyers committee recently, not because I'm unhappy with them, but because I'm doing a number of things. That's just one of them to make more time in my schedule to try to make ends meet. So, you know, that crunch you're talking about is already having an effect on me. Yeah, I mean, I can tell because it's not, not from anything that you're doing, but I'm involved in my own legal cases, nowhere uh -huh. near as complicated as 9-11, and it just takes so much time. I think that the opposition knows this, and, you know, they sure. constantly have new prosecutors and new judges, and, you know, they're fighting you, essentially, a small group of individuals where they are the machine. So I hope that viewers will contribute, lcfor911.org, and uh, make some kind of contribution, uh, co contribution here via PayPal to help the committee carry on this very important work, not just for 9-11, but in this environment that we're in where there are a lot of really nasty jurists who just don't seem to care about the rights of individuals. They, they almost relish destroying the right. I, I don't understand how they could do it because separate from their jobs as judges and attorney, uh, you know, U.S. attorneys and attorneys general, they are also citizens in this country and they're decimating the rights, um, their own rights, their family members, their loved ones. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. No, uh, I think, you know, Charlotte said earlier, this is not a Republican, Democrat or independent or any other party issue. It's a 
a democracy issue. It's a maintaining our constitutional democracy or some want to call it a republic, but it's still based on our constitution and our constitutional rights, any way you look at it, which are being eroded. And, you know, it's up to us to defend those rights. If we fail at that, our children and grandchildren are going to be living a very different reality than we've been privileged to live in a at least a functional democracy. We're getting to the point where it may not be functional. Now, you just said some people like to call yeah. it a republic. Why did you say that? Is it not a constitutional republic or is it not I, it's, supposed Well, to it's be? a semantic thing and it's a vocabulary thing. And I don't take issue with how either side describes it, either as a republic or a democracy or a constitutional democracy or a constitutional republic. I don't think it matters what you call it. What matters is what it is. And right. it is a government with a check and balance system created in the Constitution and a bunch of additional very important constitutional rights that give us all very meaningful opportunities to participate. I don't care what you call it. It's that system that's being eroded, and it's that system we need to protect. I would ask you to possibly just quickly reconsider and maybe give more value to the language, because I think that's the first step in getting everybody to think it's no problem, because my understanding is a democracy could be characterized by two wolves and a sheep deciding what's for dinner, whereas a constitutional republic establishes that we have an agreement that nobody here is eating anybody. Now, what would you like to order for dinner? I like well, the constitutional the mi minorities republic. are supposed to be protected by our system, the sheep in your analogy. Um, but a constitutional democracy would do that too. It's the protections in the constitution that matter. Right. It's not the word you use to describe it. And I'll give some thought to your vocabulary change, but I'm not likely to adopt it either way. I respect people use both vocabularies, but for me, you know, what matters is what's in the constitution and the extent to which it's being enforced or disregarded. Yeah. You, were, Jason, you had asked me how it had impacted on my career. And um, I'm both an investigative journalist and a lawyer. And, and I'm driven by the same concern for justice in both cases. But when I wrote my book about uh, Bush, my preface opens up by saying many Americans, this is 2009, before Trump, many Americans consider it common knowledge that we have just lived through eight years of a rogue presidency. The question is, have we set the stage for another rogue presidency in the future? Many believe the answer is yes. And you'll read in this book, uh, one way to prevent that is by prosecuting high officials for crimes committed in office. We're talking about crimes that were committed in office, and we're aware that that's very serious. And we're also aware that the demolition charge uh, puts the focus on our own country and who might have been involved. And that is a very serious issue. And I'm sure there are many powerful people that don't want that discussed at all. But yeah. we've come to the point where we have to keep pushing and pushing for the rights of the average citizen. And I, I end by saying, dark 2009, dark times could happen again and they could get worse. They have gotten worse. Yeah. They've gotten much worse. Yes. So it's time for the people to stand up and say enough already. Yeah. And Which you means guys have been standing we need up more for lawyers on our years. board to help us out. And we, we need an even broader grassroots uh, uh, movement to, yeah. to help push them into realizing that we're we can't take it anymore. <laughs> yeah. According well, the to lawyers that committee, movie. the lawyers committee has been standing up for everyone for years. So it is a very important thing for people who support what you're doing, which I would think should be everyone. It's very important for people to visit lcfor911.org and make a contribution. You know, Charlotte, I've just noticed something here. Is this correct or is this an Amazon typo? Was the book co-authored with Vincent Bugliosi? It's a mistake. Uh, I worked uh, with him. Okay. In fact, he came to Vermont and helped campaign with him. I was very influenced by his book. Huh. Um, yeah. So, um, 
the <laughs> outrageously titled The Prosecution of George W. Bush for Murder, okay? But I read his book very carefully, and uh, one of the things that it said is that local prosecutors can take this up. And um, so we started thinking about, well, I was running for attorney general at the time, and so I, I took up the challenge. And uh, it was it was great fun, and and very serious. And he Bugliosi was was very committed to this. Um, and there were some of us. There it is. He's now he's now deceased. Yeah. Uh, but there are many lessons. Uh, if people want to get into the the evolution of what's been going on in our country and the erosion of of democracy, it, it's so serious. And one thing about the lawyers committee, I got to say, um, we know the importance of evidence. We're very serious about having solid evidence. So they're not going to dismiss us as conspiracy theorists, you know. We, well, we are devoted. Try. Actually, in a way, you know, the January 6th committee, I was very interested in the report of the January 6th committee in which um, uh, Ari Melber of CNBC, MSNBC has written the foreword to one of those reports. because They came out in different editions. And he was talking. He said this is about a conspiracy to overthrow the government. OK, that's how serious it's become. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it, people need to re, be reminded that um, just because we're looking at malfeasance on the part of, of our government and, and powerful people, um, you know, uh, that's not to dismiss us as conspiracy theorists. It really irks me. Deeply. But they will. Won't they? They try they that all the time. They're going to have trouble with us. I'll tell you that. Well, they have had trouble with us. And <laughs> I will hasten to add that no court that I, in any case I've been involved in, no judge has, has used that term in regard to my clients in any of the cases. We've been treated with respect to that extent. Uh, they haven't made the right decisions on our cases, <laughs> except, the four, except the four year case. <laughs> But they haven't dismissed them on any excuse like, oh, they're frivolous or they're wild eyed right. speculations like in, a, in an unfounded conspiracy theory. We haven't seen that from the courts. You see that from the media in some quarters. You see it from uh, politicians in some quarters and some not. But we have gotten perhaps a little more delicate treatment, possibly because we're lawyers. And, you know, if you bite us, we might bite back. And we would. If we get defamed, I would. If I get defamed, so we'll we'll see how that goes. But up to this point, I think we've earned enough respect that we don't get dismissed that way. But other folks in the movement still get have to deal with that, and uh, it's time we got past it. I mean, Charlotte is correct. I, I don't know how many conspiracy crimes DOJ prosecutes every year and gets convictions on a lot of them, and and a lot of them are based on a lot. Uh, more flimsy evidence than what we put forward in our petition, which is pretty scientifically dispositive. So this conspiracy thing is just propaganda. Well, exactly. I mean, but they use it like a hammer and just pound on whoever they're trying to target. Now, so tomorrow, the Supreme Court will be considering your case. Is there a way for people, I, I've heard it like audio, is there a way for people to listen to this while it's happening? Not to or? my knowledge. Um, it's not uh, a public hearing, it's a private uh -huh. conference. The judges and their clerks consider a number of cases, it won't just be ours. I think they have had probably memos written about each of the cases in advance that have Will been circulated to all. Sorry? Will they leak it? Sometimes they do no, that. I don't know if those memos have ever been have ever been leaked. It'd be interesting to see some of those memos. Uh, the but, abortion um, thing got leaked. No, I think we're waiting to let the Supreme Court process work in private until they decide. Once they decide to take our case on the merits, it becomes a very public process. At which point there'll be a legal briefs filed that'll be public. There'll be an oral argument that'll be probably highly publicized and very public. But their decision about how to exercise their discretion, they take maybe one or two percent of the cases that come to them only. Hmm. And in the good old days, way back, possibly before our births, I believe the Supreme Court actually had a role as a sort of a mandatory appeal step of right. 
where they had to consider cases that were brought to them that changed probably because too many. as our country grew too many cases are being presented for them to decide them all hmm. so now it's discretionary uh they don't have to take any particular case unless they want to doesn't seem so fair so you mentioned that there's a play i mean obviously everything you guys have said here today i believe is correct they're going to want to not allow this to go to oral arguments and discovery and all these things because obviously they don't want that information coming i mean some I, people you know, don't i don't know i understand what why you say that if it doesn't if the supreme court says take a hike what's the well, plan that's, pl- that's plan b yeah okay so we do have a plan b probably a plan c and a plan d we always have had um but first let me just before i give you plan b and charlotte yeah. may want to chime in uh just say that i'm not pessimistic I don't always agree with what the Supreme Court does, by the way, on various decisions, including constitutional issues, and not just this Supreme Court, but prior Supreme Courts as well. But this, I mean, the the three issues that are now in front of them in our case alone are one, the constitutional independence of the grand jury and its sword and shield functions, both of which could be undercut. Two, whether there is some now higher, just created standard standing burden for citizens to get their constitutional rights enforced other than a violation of their rights which is huge and has broad applications as you mentioned and then um there's an issue about the right of access to certain grand jury documents and um there's the issue about whether citizens even have a right to petition grand juries because the second circuit wants to treat the grand jury as an exception to the First Amendment right to petition and basically say they're a carve out to that First Amendment right to petition, even though they're a government entity. That's unheard of. So this Supreme Court has a lot to think about in our case. And I think a lot of the justices, maybe all of them on the Supreme Court, have a concern about at least one of those constitutional issues that I just mentioned and may not want to see, you know, those those rights uh, eviscerated. Yeah, I. I um, listened carefully, and we and we debated we debated carefully on the board about this because of the nature of the Supreme Court. We all know what that is. Very, uh, very conservative justices are the majority now, and some have said, you know, come on, what you really think they're going to take this up? And and I agree with Mick. You know, you could be surprised sometimes. For instance. You may, in, in your introduction, you showed that picture of me with the redacted documents, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, right. I have gotten that whole report unredacted. Ooh. How'd you oh, do yeah. that? Yeah. Well, it's a long story, and you can read about it. Ah, yes. In, in Follow the Pipelines. But, um, yeah, I actually, now, again, it may be that because I was the daughter of uh, one of them, so to speak. I sued the hmm. CIA, right? Wow. They may have given me a little bit more deference. I really don't know. Uh, but they they ended up uh, coming around. I actually had a private audience um, with the director. Wow. And, uh, Which one? <laughs> well, I was invited. A- after I kept pressing for the truth, you know, they actually... <laughs> They came around and invited me and my family to go down to, to Langley, Virginia, and um, they they gave us the royal treatment. Uh, I'm surprised honored, you came back. <laughs> and, uh, and honored my father as uh, the first fallen star. Wow. Uh, they have a wall of stars, and he was the first, and he had been neglected, and they honored wow. him. And they said they would create a room for him, which made me very proud. And you know why? Because he cared deeply about democracy. Deeply. I think many of them feel that way. They're probably very uncomfortable with some of the tasks that they're given. I bet you there are judges out there that feel uncomfortable. I think most Americans care deeply about democracy. And that is the issue that's before us right now. So surprises can happen. And uh, you never know. And, yeah. and the point is that we keep pressing. We keep pressing. We can't, because if we don't press, what have we got? Yeah. We've got right. nothing. So I promised to talk about plan B, but yes. 
Um, let me ask just one footnote, and then I'll tell you Plan B. And that is that I don't think the First Amendment is a conservative or a liberal issue. I don't think grand jury independence is a conservative or a liberal issue. Now, these are protections for people of all persuasions, and at different times, depending on who's in power, you know, one group needs them more than others. So, you know, neither liberals nor Democrats can afford to see these rights eviscerated. So let me stop on that and talk about Plan B. So this case is intended to do something we thought was a fairly simple task, which is to have a petition which was painstakingly crafted by me and my colleagues based on years and years of work by many scientists, architects, and engineers, articulating evidence of a bombing crime on 9-11 at the Trade Center and getting that evidence in the hands of a grand jury, just getting it delivered. If it got delivered, our, our job for that case would have been over, okay? Nothing else was planned. The goal was to get it delivered and let the grand jury do its thing independently. We, we respected the grand jury's independence in that regard. So that didn't happen. Now, we're not giving up on achieving that goal of getting this evidence in the hands of a grand jury, even if the Supreme Court doesn't take up our case. There are options available to us. One is to go to a federal judge, including in New York, but in other jurisdictions as well, and ask the judge to hand the evidence to a grand jury. This whole last case that is now in, you know, to be considered by the Supreme Court tomorrow, it was all about getting the U.S. attorney to follow that statutory duty to hand it, hand our petition to the grand jury. That is not the only route. A judge can do that as well, bypassing the U.S. attorney. So all we need to do is convince a judge that this evidence, which is, by the way, very scientifically persuasive, I would say dispositive, all you need is a judge to agree that, yes, this is substantial evidence of a federal crime, a grand jury has a right to see this and make its own decision, I, the judge, will hand this to a grand jury. I love it that you just said all you need is a judge to agree. That's like me saying, Mick, how do I marry a supermodel? And you say, all you need to do is find a supermodel hey, who wants hey, to marry don't give you. Up, don't give up on this. <laughs> but, uh, no, and I don't mean to be it, negative, but it's a, no, it's no, a big no. ask. With the well, it, it, it is a negative thing. A lot of folks agree with you in terms of the odds of getting a judge to look at this uh, objectively. I don't share that skepticism, at least not yet. It hasn't been put to the test in our case. Our case is very strong. You know, I had a judge, I've had judges rule for me appointed by various presidents of various persuasions politically, and I've had judges rule against me from various persuasions appointed by various judges, and not all in the direction you would have predicted. Yeah. Uh, and, and a lot of those judges are making decisions based on what they consider the law and the facts to be, and their job as a jurist to decide what the law requires. Some judges, believe it or not, still do that. And, you know, I'm concerned about corruption in the federal government and sometimes corruption in the judiciary, but I'm not concerned yet that that corruption is so pervasive that there's no avenue to get a remedy. If I did believe that, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. Yeah. I appreciate you saying that, Mick. Thank you. And that is something for people to remain hopeful about. I share your hope. And I the don't truth think someone will come could out. do. The truth will, it will come out. I don't think anyone could do what the two of you and your colleagues at the Lawyers Committee for 9 11 Inquiry have been doing if they didn't have that hope. And I really appreciate what you just said, Mick. I hope that viewers will go to lcfor911.org, read the documents on the Lawyers Committee website, click on the donate tab. And even if you're sending five or ten dollars, I think if hundreds and thousands of people see this and, and recognize the importance of what's being done, there is still a chance for there to be uh, justice and truth with regard to 9-11. Would either of you like to say anything before we go? Have we covered everything that you feel you want to discuss today? I want to thank you, Jason. And I want to remind everyone that there is a role for journalists like you. Uh, it's very important. Uh, what would we do without you? You know? So, <laughs> thank you. Yes. Yeah, thank yeah, you. I, I want to re follow the pipelines because this is a very yeah. interesting story. And I just learned about the book today. So I think people should yeah. check that out on Amazon. Mick, why don't you uh, take us out if you have a final thought? Well, statement? final thoughts. First of all, I did owe thanks to you, Jason, 
and I hope you do have Charlotte back, uh, talk about one or both of her books. But uh, on your point about donations, no matter how small, those small donations really can be quite inspiring to us. Uh, they tend to hurt more than the bigger ones because the bigger ones come from folks who can afford it. So even though we desperately need large donors to come forward, I mean, now is the time to do this, to keep this movement going and our efforts going. Those small donations still inspire us to keep going, and so we appreciate them. I know exactly what you mean. There have been times that people have sent me maybe 2 or $3, and they apologize. They say, I'm sorry right. that this is all I can send. But it almost right. brings me to tears because someone, this isn't somebody sitting in a mansion. This is somebody who's saying, you know what? I really don't have any money, but I think this is so important. I got to thank both of you and all of the lawyers at the Lawyers Committee and everybody who makes this show possible. I want to remind people they can support Crowdsource the Truth on Subscribestar.com and Patreon.com and Odyssey. And Mick, everybody's going to be uh, very eager to hear the results from the Supreme Court. And we'll definitely have you guys back sooner than later to discuss the outcome and uh, hopefully talk about the oral arguments and everything that's going to happen next. So thanks, everybody, for watching. And thanks to the lawyers from the Lawyers Committee. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you, See Jason. you, Jason. Thank you.